Hello everyone, I will be listening to this lecture for the first time and maybe giving some of my thoughts throughout. And uh, this is by a very famous, um, very famous lecture. So I'm excited to see what it's all the, about. The uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice specifies court-martial for any officer who sends a soldier into battle without a weapon. There ought to be a similar protection for students because students shouldn't go out into life without an ability to communicate. And that's because your success in life will be determined largely by your ability to speak, mm. your ability to write, and the quality of your ideas in that order. Okay, so I think this is an interesting comparison. And I like how he made that distinction because it's kind of like assuming that, um, I mean, at the end, between... Um, speaking writing and the quality of the ideas so it's kind of like the quality of your ideas that should be maybe the main merit that people consider but uh what really ends up having all the effect is actually the way that people present those ideas i know that i can be successful in this because and I did actually uh, go to the website where it was kind of like, um, I think it was in memory of Patrick Winston. So there, one of the uh, quotes was that basically he said, uh, I forget, something about um, how he would teach um, teach the other lecturers basically, or uh, the person he was mentoring, basically how to use the space on the blackboard and how to actually get the ideas across with like using different colored chalks. So these types of things were actually um, very highly uh, weighted in his consideration of maybe teaching, I would say. Quality of communication, your speaking, your writing, is largely determined by this formula. It's a matter of how much knowledge you have, how much you practice with that knowledge, and your inherent talent. And notice that the T is very small. What really matters is what you know. This is very interesting. Um, I haven't really seen anyone make an equation and write the letters of different sizes before, so that is actually a nice uh, thing I should do in the future. This point uh, came to me... Uh, but also the point of talent. Uh, talent is definitely like something that gets you started, but as I've learned, it's not really enough to go all the way. Suddenly, a few decades ago when I was skiing at Sun Valley, I had heard that it was Celebrity Weekend. And one of the celebrities was, a, was a Mary Lou Retton, famous Olympic gymnast, perfect tens in the vault. And I heard that she was a novice at skiing. So when the opportune moment arrived, I looked over on a novice slope and saw this young woman who, when she became unbalanced, went like that. And I said, that's got to be her. That must be the gymnast. But then it occurred to me, I'm a much better skier than she is. And she's an Olympic athlete, not only an ordinary Olympic athlete, an outstanding one. And I was a better skier because I had the K, and mm -hmm. I had the P, and all she had was the T. Of course. So you can get a lot better than people who may have inherent talents if you have the right amount of knowledge. So that's what my objective is today, and here's my promise. Today you will see some examples. You could have just made that story up, actually. <laughs> but uh, since he's like kind of old, I would assume it's true. But, I mean, making up fake stories seems perfectly reasonable, although it's harder than just having it happen. Harder to tell the story. Examples of what you can put in your armamentorium of speaking techniques. And it will be the case that some one of those examples, some heuristic, some technique, maybe only one, will, make, will be the one that gets you the job. Looking forward to it. And so this is a very non-linear process. You never know when it's going to happen. But that is my promise. By the end of the next 60 minutes, 
you know, they've been exposed to a lot of ideas, some of which you'll incorporate into your own repertoire. Yeah, I've actually had this video recommended to me several times. I think it's been getting recommended to me for like one or two years. I'm not actually sure, but today I've decided to actually watch it. And they will ensure that you get the maximum opportunity to uh, have your ideas uh, valued and accepted by the people you speak with. Now, in order to do that, we have to have a rule of engagement. And that is... Oh, right. So, um, this is one hour long, which might be the reason I didn't uh, watch it before, but for today, I think I'll do like maybe 20 minutes since I'm kind of talking every couple of seconds. So, um, I think after 20 minutes, I'm going to get to like a part where it's a good place to stop. And then I can make like part two and three later on. Because right now it's quite late. I'm working on sleeping earlier, so let's just continue. No laptops, no cell phones. Hmm. So if you could close those, that's an I'll interesting rule. As soon as you're done. Some people ask why that uh, is a is a rule of engagement, hmm. and the answer is we humans only have one language processor, and if your language processor is engaged, could you shut the laptop, please? If your language processor is engaged browsing the web or reading your email, you're distracted. And worse mm. yet, you distract all of the people around you. Studies have shown that. And worse yet, if I see an open laptop somewhere back there or up here, it drives me nuts. <laughs> and I do a worse job. And so that ensures mm. that all of your friends who, work, who are paying attention uh, don't get the performance that they came to have. Very so, interesting. that's it for preamble. Let's get started. It's kind of like a selfishly... First thing to talk about, of course, um, is how to start. Thing. Some people think the right thing to do is to idea. start a talk with a joke. Hmm, interesting. That does work. I don't recommend it. <laughs> mm. And the reason is that in the beginning of a talk, people are still putting their laptops away. They're becoming adjusted to your speaking parameters, to your vocal parameters. And they're no not ready jokes. for a joke. So it doesn't work very well. They usually fall flat. What you want to do instead is start with empowerment promise. Promise. I didn't write this down. You want down. to tell people what they're going to know at the end of the hour that they didn't know at the beginning of the hour. Hmm. It's an empowerment promise. It's the reason for being here. It's all dust. Uh, what would be an example? Oh, I see. At the end of uh, this 60 minutes, you will know things about speaking you don't know now, and something among those things you know will be, make a difference in your life. Yeah, that's an empowerment promise. So that's the best way to start. Start talking. So now that I've talked a little bit about how to start, what I want to do is give you some samples of heuristics that are always on my mind when I give a talk. And the first of these heuristics is that it's a good idea to cycle on the subject. Heuristics is an interesting phrase. Go around it. Used more in, um, I guess, kind of uh, problems where you can't really find the optimal solution. So you kind of just follow some uh, sets of rules or general um, ways of uh, correctness, you could say, uh, or some way to find or approximate an uh, optimal solution. So, this cycling thing. Go around it again, go around it again. Some people he drew say, it not like a string, but him. like uh, kind of like a Kind of like a, what's it called? Cyclone shape. It gets bigger and bigger. That might mean the understanding also gets bigger as uh, the topic is repeated. Tell them again, and then tell them a third time. Yeah, there is um, there's another quote that I saw on the website where it was like, um, he told this uh, PhD student that he was, only going to read the introduction 
because that should tell him everything about the dissertation. And then he said, oh, I'm going to read the abstract because I should tell him everything about the dissertation. But he did end up reading the whole thing, so that's interesting. As if people weren't intelligent. But the point is, the reason is, well, there are many reasons, one of which is at any given moment, about 20% of you will be fogged out no matter what the lecture is. Mm. So if you want to ensure that the probability that everybody gets it is high, you need to say it three times. Three times. So cycling is one of the things that I always think about when I give a talk. Another thing I think about is in explaining my idea, I want to build a fence around it. Fence. Huh. So that it's not confused with somebody else's idea. Okay. So if you were from Mars and I was teaching you about what an arch is, I might say to you, well, that's an arch. And that's not to be confused with some other things that other people might think is an arch. This is not an arch. That's not an arch. I'm building a fence around my idea so that it can be distinguished from somebody else's idea. So in a more technical sense, I might say, well, uh, my algorithm might, similar, might seem similar to Jones's algorithm, except his is exponential and mine's linear. That's putting a fence around your idea uh, so that people can not be confused about how it might relate to something else. I actually should have used this once. It was, um, I think I was in eighth grade presenting something like a science fair idea. Basically, it was um, storing information by putting it in, um, I think it was like silicon, uh, like a mold for DNA. So you can actually encode you know, every uh, character using some variation of the, um, the four nucleotides. And uh, there was one person there who asked me the question, why don't you just use Hoffman encoding? And I actually didn't know what that was at the time. So uh, I actually should have explained first that there's like a thermodynamic, um, what's it called, requirement. And even though my encoding method is not optimal, it is for um, the thermodynamic uh, aspect where there aren't going to be any stability problems. So uh, if I could have learned this sooner, I definitely would have used it. The third thing on the... I ended up getting like a second tier kind of award. And if I had explained that properly, I think the judges uh, might have uh, perceived my type of invention differently. This list of samples is the idea of verbal punctuation. Punctuation? <clears throat> oh yeah, <laughs> I speak mostly in this type of tone. And the idea here is um, that I think I could because use people this. will uh, occasionally fog out and need to get back on the bus, you need to provide some landmark places where you're announcing that it's a good time to get back on. So I might, in this talk, say something about this being my outline. The first thing we're going to do is uh, talk about how to start. Then we're going to deal with these four samples. And among these four samples, I've talked about the first idea, that's cycling. The second idea, building a And now the third idea is, build, is verbal punctuation. Hmm. So I'm enumerating now the that numbers. Is some, uh... I'm giving you a sense that there's a seam in the talk and you can get back, back on. Very interesting. I actually, okay. I mean, he's really putting his, his, uh, his ideas into practice here. Um, kind of like how that one person uh, from the website also said the same thing about him living his uh, ideals when he did the thing with um, saying, I'm only going to read the intro, I'm only going to read the abstract. So now we're on a roll. And of course, uh, I think... Since we're on a roll... Uh, now it's time for the fourth one. Guess what fourth idea might be here? An idea that helps people get back on the bus? Oh, asking questions. I'm gonna, that's my guess. He just asked a question, so I mean, that was kind of a clue. How come no one here yes. is getting it? 
ask a question. Yes. Yo, right. let's go. Uh, faster than the average MIT student right here. So ask a question. And so I will ask a question. How, how much curve, dead air yes. can there be? How long can I pause? Uh, I counted seven seconds. It seems like an eternity to me to wait and not say anything for, ten, for seven seconds. But that's the, the standard amount of time you can wait for an answer. And of course, seven the question seconds. has to be carefully chosen. It can't be too obvious, because then people will be embarrassed to say it, what the answer is. can't be too hard, because then nobody will have anything to say. I should actually start um, critiquing my teacher's questions. Because some of them are like too easy, and then no one wants to answer. And you know, they say there's no stupid questions, but if you ask a question at a stupid time, then the question might not be stupid, but uh, the effect of it is kind of stupid, or it's ineffective. So here are some sample heuristics you can put in your. Like the gonna... question might be good for a different audience, just um, just not this one. So the context is what's really important. Mentorium, and build up your your repertoire of uh, ideas about presentation. Hmm. And now. If this persuades you that there is something to know, that there, there, there is knowledge, then I've already succeeded. Because what I want to convince you of is that if you watch the speakers you admire. I think this, this part of the presentation makes you think back to the beginning about the promise. And then the second part, we mentioned that again. So very smart move from Mr. Winston here. And feel are effective and ask yourselves why they're successful then you can build up your own personal repertoire. You know, I just asked why he's successful when I said that he's tying back to the beginning. And develop your own personal style. And that's, that's my fundamental mm. objective. And the rest of uh, And he just said fundamental objective, which even more makes you go back. That's the cycling once again. So talk is about some of the uh, things this that guy are is, on the auditorium. There's a phrase in Mandarin. It's a Lao Zian Zhu Hua. I first um, heard it Basically, uh, when I was playing chess against a uh, international master, I mean, I wasn't like playing him in a real game. It was like a practice game. He was actually my teacher. So, um, basically, it's a phrase that means uh, an old person who's kind of like a sly fox, who's like really um, knowledgeable. You could say they know all of the tricks. They know all of the lines in the, in chess. Uh, for whatever variation, and they just smoke the newbies. And uh, I would say that Mr. Winston is very much the same way. I think are effective. So, next thing on our agenda, as we start to discuss these other things, mm. is a discussion of time and place. So what do you think is a good time to have a lecture? Time and place. 11 a.m. Yeah. Very <laughs> Wait, wait, is this? I'm going to assume this lecture is at 11 a.m. And the reason is mm. most people at MIT are awake by then, and hardly anyone has gone back to sleep. <laughs> it's not right after a meal. People aren't fatigued from this or that. It's a great time to have a lecture. You know, I would actually think like, um, you know, like the 3, 3 p.m., 2 p.m., uh, or even like maybe right now. Right now it's like nine or eight. I think it's nine by now. But so that brings um, me I think the way that I think about it is kind of like the peak gaming hours are actually like you know like four to five p.m. around three, because that's when uh, the kids get home. But for this, I guess the lectures are um, a bit different. And this is like a college setting. So I think he's not really saying 11 a.m. for every situation. He's really saying for the college audience, you have to have 11 a.m. And then uh, kind of transferring that into the idea of context, you have to think about your own context when giving the talk. Okay, next to the question of uh, what about the place? The place. And the most important thing about the place is that it be well lit. 
<laughs> this is interesting. This room is well lit. Actually, I do. Um, I do like to always turn on the lights in the classroom, even when like other people are like, it's too bright, it hurts my eyes. It doesn't really make sense to me actually. Um, but I do actually prefer a well lit place because here's my reasoning: if you want to take notes on paper instead of a laptop, then you're definitely gonna need a well lit place, or even if you're like reading. You need to be in a well-lit place, because otherwise it's like, how are you going to see what you're writing or reading? I mean, unless you're breaking the first rule about um, the laptops, that would be detrimental. The problem with the other kinds of rooms is that we humans, uh, whenever the lights go down, or whenever the room is dimly lighted, it signals that we should go to sleep. So whenever I go somewhere to give a talk, even today, oh. The first thing I do when I speak to That's the individual people idea. is say, keep the lights full up. I mean, he's kind of like, he's gone one step further than the average person would think about things. It's like, he's going on to the biological level saying, darkness means uh, signaling sleep. Let me just turn off the lights right now, actually, because I do want to be able to go to sleep right after this. All right, let's continue. Oh, the or, or should I... Should I actually turn the lights on? Because that would be kind of following his idea of uh, he wants to give a lecture in a brightly lit place. So I should actually be in a brightly lit place. That's interesting. And also this goes back to another thing I saw on the website. Um, there's something about the setting and what he would do. Oh no, it was about the way that he thinks about things in unique ways. I think it was, um, he asked the class uh, that he was lecturing, uh, has anyone ever bagged groceries before? Which is like, you know, you work at, um, the cashier. No, it's kind of like being a cashier. Basically, um, you scan all the items at the grocery store and then you put them in bags. Let me pick up my pen right now. All right. So, um, I think what he was, uh, talking about there was basically, I know what he was talking about. So he was like, what should you do exactly? And then the student said, um, you should, you know, put the large items there, heavy items there, fragile items there, and put the cold items next to each other. Now, I found that really interesting because uh, Mr. Winston, he asked another question. He was like, but why do you put the cold stuff together? And then the student said, well, and of course, all the students are coming from like uh, after the first year physics uh, classes where there's like thermodynamic stuff. Uh, the student said, well, the cold stuff keeps other cold stuff cold. And this is from the background where it's like um, heat propagates outward. And then uh, everyone laughed, but then he continued to question. He was like, but why? Why? does the cold stuff actually keep the other cold stuff cold? And the eventual answer is that um, rather than scattering them about, which would have a larger surface area, when you put them together, this is an idea in discrete math, I would assume, when you put them together, they share some sides. And that means that basically, um, there's going to be less heat transferred uh, away from the cold areas because the surface area is smaller in total. So the net transfer of heat will be lower as well. People will see the slides better if we turn the lights off. That's and then I reply, it's extremely hard to see slides through closed eyelids. <laughs> okay. So that is interesting. I mean, it's actually a reasonable... Um, assumption because well while well, while this is a joke uh it's also kind of true because on the topic of um just people paying attention earlier he said um 20 percent of people are going to be fogged out and at any given time of course and when you turn the lights off back to the biological thing it increases that number uh that proportion 
by some amount, and that's not what you want. What else can you say about the place? Well, the place should be cased. Cased. Yeah. And I mean that in a colloquial sense of, like, uh, if you're robbing a bank, you would go to the bank. A, you know, some some. If you're robbing a bank, oh, he's a, you would I go to the hear. bank. A, you know, some some occasions before to see what it's like, so there are no surprises when you uh, when you do your robbery. Oh, I see. Yeah. So uh, whenever I go somewhere to speak, the first thing I ask my host to do is to take me to the place where I'll be speaking, so that if there are any weirdnesses, I'll be able to uh, to deal with it. Uh, sometimes it might require some intervention. Sometimes it just might require me to understand what the challenges are. So when I can yeah, there are some uh, rooms at classrooms at my school where the you know the board doesn't work or there's no markers or there's like some other problem. The sharpener doesn't work for the pencils, or there's like a problem with the computer, things like that. Came here this morning. I mean, of course, for like a public school salary, I think. The average teacher might not really be willing to put all that time into uh, uh, their teaching. I did what I typically do. I imagined that all the seats were filled with disinterested farm animals. <laughs> that way I knew that no matter how bad it was, Slight it smiling. wouldn't be as bad as that. So uh, finally, it should be reasonably, it should be reasonably populated. Hmm. That is a problem with my coding club, so. It should be, it should be the case that, you know, if there are 10 people in this hall, everyone would be wondering uh, what's going on that's so much more interesting that nobody's here. So you want to get a right-sized place that doesn't have to be packed, but it has to be more than half full. More than half. So those are some thoughts about uh, time and place. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, subject of uh, boards and props and slides. Well, these are the tools of the trade. Uh, I uh, believe that this is the, uh, this is the, the uh, right tool for uh, speaking when your purpose is uh, informing. Uh, the slides are good when your purpose is uh, exposing. But this is what Slides exposing, interesting, and then that is informing, interesting distinction. Slides, what is that, exposing, and chalk informing. Let's what I use when I'm informing, teaching, lecturing. And there are several reasons why I use it. For one thing, when you use the board, you have a graphic quality. Graphic. It's the case that when you have a board, then you can easily exploit the fact that you can use graphics in your presentation. My goodness. So that's a graphic quality that I like. This guy is, is very sly. I mean, he's... <laughs> He's really pulling out all the stops. It's very meta. Like the next thing I like is like a speed property. And he's probably done this like a billion times. Like he probably thinks about this all day. The speed with which you write on the blackboard is approximately the speed at which people can absorb ideas. If you mm. go flipping through a bunch of slides, nobody can go that fast. Of course. Finally, one great property of a board great revelations right here. is that it's, it can be a target. Targets. Many people who are novices at speaking find themselves uh, suddenly aware of their hands. It's a, as if their hands were private parts that shouldn't be exposed in public, so right away they go into the pockets. <laughs> And this is considered insulting in some parts of the world. Or yeah. alternatively, maybe the hands will go in, in, in back like this. I was uh, once in a convent in Serbia, 
and uh, my uh, host, uh, well, we were, as soon as we entered, a nun came up to us and offered us a refreshment. And I was about to say, no, thank you, when he said, eat that stuff or die. <laughs> it's a question of uh, local custom and, and, and politeness. But then, uh, before anything happened there, uh, okay, this this guy is actually like too too sly. Yeah, none pulled my hands off. Like oh, me. never mind. I thought he was doing that as like a reference. Yes, because it was extraordinarily insulting in that culture to have your hands behind your back. I mean, my dad does this, and uh, I don't think anyone's ever. They might have gotten offended. I don't know if he does it all the time, but. Uh, this is something my dad does a lot. So, uh, why is that? And my mom actually really dislikes that. Well, it's, it's usually a supposed... I guess he's gonna give us the answer right now. That's what, that it has to do with whether you're concealing a weapon. So if mm. your hands are in your pocket... So it's like a psychological thing, probably. It's behind your back. Then, um, it looks like you uh, might have a weapon. And that's what I mean by the virtue, one of these virtues of the board. Now you have something to do with your hands. You can point out the stuff. Okay, this is what I was talking about. So this is the part where he gets really sly and starts doing the meta stuff. I was once watching Seymour Papert give a lecture. I thought it was terrific. So I went a second time. First time to absorb the content, second time to note the style. And what I discovered is that Papert was constantly pointing at the board. And then I thought about it a little while and I noted that none of the stuff he was pointing to had anything to do with what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he just did that again? I didn't even catch it that time. Oh my goodness. Oh. Oh man. So that's an example of when you lose to a master and you can't help but uh, be happy. Nevertheless, it was an effective technique. So that's a, just a little bit about the, the virtue of, of, of blackboards. Now I want to talk uh, about props. You know, the custodians of uh, knowledge about props are the playwrights. Uh, many decades ago, I saw a play by Heinrich Ibsen. He actually has props right in front of him. That's very interesting. So this is the part where you cycle back again in your thought, and you think, well, he used that uh, that that arch from earlier, or is that an arc? Uh, arch, yeah. And it was Hedda Gabler. Uh, I remember vaguely that it was about a woman in an unhappy in marriage, and her husband was in competition for an academic job with somebody else, and he was gonna lose, partly because he was boring, and partly because the competitor had just written a magnificent book. By the way, this is back in the days before there were copying machines and computers. Anyhow, anyhow, as the uh, play opens, there's a uh, pot-bellied stove. I actually wasn't paying attention because I was checking my phone just now for the time. And uh, I have no idea what he said in the last minute, so let's just go back. Actually, uh, I, I remember vaguely that it was about a woman in an unhappy marriage. No. Many decades of uh, knowledge I didn't about even it. understand the part about the... I didn't even remember the part about the unhappy marriage thing. I think so I have to go back. So that's just a little bit about the, the virtue of, a, of, of blackboards. Now I want to talk uh, about props. Okay, we have to read something here. You know, the custodians of uh, knowledge about props are the playwrights. Uh, many decades ago, I saw a play by Heinrich it. Ibsen. It was Hedda Gabler. Uh, uh, I remember vaguely that it was about a woman in an unhappy marriage, mm -hmm. and her husband was in competition for an academic job with somebody else, and he was gonna lose, partly because he was boring, and partly because the competitor had just written a magnificent book. By the way, this is back in the days before there were copying machines and computers. Anyhow, anyhow as the uh, play opens. So now I understand what just happened in what he said. There's a uh, pot-bellied stove. What's he going to do? And in the beginning of the play, uh, the putt belly stove with its so open door there. just has some uh, slightly glowing embers. Uh, but the putt belly stove is always there, and its tension mounts in the play. Uh, and you see this manuscript, this prop that Ibsen so artfully used. You just know that uh, something's going to happen 
because as the play goes on, the fire gets bigger and hotter, and finally all consuming, and you just know that that man. This kind of reminds me of a version of Hangman that uh, I think I used to play in. A, I think it might have been middle school, yeah. Basically, uh, because you know we were so bad at Hangman. We got to like have a lot more guesses, and basically, um, we had the thing where it was like a, the fire is rising. Actually, this might have been elementary school. I don't remember, but this kind of just reminds me of that. Um, this might be part of uh, Mr. Winston's big plan, his grand plan to make me remember things. Your script is using imagery. It's going to go into that fire. It's a memorable thing. It's what I remember. Is he gonna actually burn the prop? Probably not, right? That would set off an alarm. Oh, why? Unless he cased the place, this lecture room, and realized that there's no. Or he made them turn off the uh, smoke alarms. So, the playwrights have. This keeps his options open because it keeps the students guessing uh, about what could happen during this lecture. Got this all figured out. Uh, but on the other hand, although this is kind of like distracting, actually, so I don't think it's the case. Yeah, because um, if people think that there's always cool stuff that's about to happen, it shouldn't be specific. Like, no one should go that far into um, is he gonna light that thing on fire? Or um, that might be what he wants, actually. I don't really have a solid line of reasoning right now. This is just some speculation. They're not the only people who can use props. Here's an example of the use of a prop. Also, due to Seymour Papert, he was talking about how it's important to look at the problem in the right way. And here's a, an example that uh, not only teaches that, but makes it possible for you to embarrass your friends in mechanical engineering. So here's, here's what you do. You take this bicycle wheel, you start it spinning, and then you put some torque on the axle. Or equivalently, you blow on the edge. And the issue is, does it go that way? Or does it go that way? Hmm. Now the mechanical engineers will immediately say, oh yes, I see, right hand screw wheel. And they'll put their fingers in this position, but forget exactly how to align their fingers with the various aspects of the problem. Hmm. And so it's usually the case that they get it right with about a 50% probability. <laughs> So their um, very fancy education gets them up to the point where they're equivalent to flipping a coin. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way because you can think about the problem a little differently. So here's what you do. You take some duct tape and you... Uh, okay, so this is actually just completely unrelated, which goes back to my point, which was um, he might be doing this just to distract people to prove Actually, that wasn't my point before. My point before was kind of like, he's really doing this really distracting thing. Like, if you were to think about the possibility of him burning that book in the classroom, it would be really distracting. And what he's doing now is just intentionally distracting. It's not even subtle at all, like the previous example. Now it's just like, he's actually just actually trying to just distract you. Maybe later, to, maybe later on he can say, um, later on he can say, well, that just proves how effective props are because you can make your audience focus on anything you want. Put it around a part of the wheel like that. And now you start to think about But then, because he's distracting with a purpose, he's actually contributing to his main message. Uh, not the whole Very sly of him. Whole wheel. Okay, and uh, it's 20 minutes now, so... I'll stop recording after this demonstration. Oh, but just a little piece that's underneath the duct tape. So here that piece comes rolling over the top, and at this point you blow on it with a puff of air. Forgetting about the rest of the wheel, what happens to that little piece that's under the duct tape? It must want to go that way, because you banged on it like that. It's already going down like that. And what about the next piece? Same thing. Next piece, same thing. So the only thing that can happen is that the wheel goes over like that. And so now you'll never mm -hmm. wonder again. 
because you're thinking about the problem in the right way, and it's demonstrated by the use of a prop. You can try this after we're done. <laughs> Actually, that really wasn't distracting. It was kind of just proving his point. So, uh, my retraction is he is not distracting and then going back for the meta thing. He's just proving his point with the pro. Another example I like to uh, remember is one from when I was taking 801. Okay, okay, so I'll just stop here. This is uh, 2050. All right. Um, let's see, my concluding thoughts. I think he really is a very good teacher. I think he really thinks about uh, the stuff that he teaches, especially in this lecture, which is Kind of like his uh, magnum opus, I think, in the minds of most people. I don't know, actually. But I think this is what he's mostly known for on the internet. Um, hmm. If there are any main things I would have to consider, probably the four things he mentioned at the start, which was Promise, cycle, fence. No, the promise was just the start. Okay. Cycle, fence, punctuation, question. So those are very important. Um, I did have something to say earlier, but then I got lost when I was, um, what do you call it? When I was hypothesizing about this type of uh, what he's going to do with the prop. Uh, but one win for myself today is that I figured out it was uh, ask a question before anyone in the audience. So good for me. Although, no, actually, there's no caveats. That's just a win. Uh, let's see. The point about the well lit and how it signals the darkness signals you know need for sleep I think that was very interesting and it really demonstrated how deeply uh, this guy thinks about problems or even the most ordinary things um, there were some points where I was actually you know asking the questions uh, Kind of trying to figure out what he's going to do next. Uh, one rule for myself, if I were to make a similar type of uh, doctrine in terms of learning, is try to guess what the guy's going to do next, what the teacher is going to do next. Always try to stay one step ahead. Um, because if you can do that, then you will not lose focus. And there's probably more reasons that I can't think of right now, but intuitively, it seems like a good idea. And I, that might turn out to be wrong. Maybe it's better to focus on what's going on right now. However, uh, I've noticed that one part, one good part of um, staying ahead of the lecture is that when they pose a question, you will have already been going down that train of thought. And when you encounter... Uh, problems in your everyday life, you will also try to stay one step, ahead, one step ahead of the current situation. Although that might not be true because these are very different things. The lessons of life are often much more unpredictable than the lessons of a teacher. And that is actually a better conclusion than the one I would have thought of before, even though I just forgot it. So, thank you for watching. See you guys next time for part two, where we will continue with this steel ball duct tape. Uh, that's not duct tape. I don't know what type of tape that is, uh, but that prop. So, thank you for watching, and see you guys next time.